My saying has always been, don't let depreciation get in the way of innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Download, third episode of The Download. My name is Jake Sherrill. I'm the founder and chairman of Tier 4. Uh, what we do is we help you find the right IT vendor with a database of hundreds of different IT vendors worldwide. Whether it's a data center or telecom or managed services project, you come to Tier 4. We help you shrink those timelines down from what could be 6 to 12 months down to, in some cases, three to 12 weeks. And uh, been in business now eight years. So we are here to help you as a subject matter expert on your team. I was wondering about that, eight years? Eight years. <clears throat> nice, man. Been a lot of fun. Brooks, founder of Renovar, tell us about that. So what uh, we do is uh, technical project and vendor, vendor management. So working with a great partner like you guys, right? Uh, sitting on the side of the table with the customer, there's that gap where when you guys help select somebody as a vendor, they need, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And we'll get into this a little bit overworked and underpaid and underappreciated, right? How IT, I'm here, as you hearing my mic? Oh yeah. I keep fading, okay. Loud anyway, that's, that's, that's kind of what we do, you know, project management, technical. You're also a partner with us here at Tier 4. Tell us a little bit about what you do for our folks at Tier 4 and how you might help clients in the future. Yeah, I, uh, I help with the solutions architecture, right? Helping uh, all your folks, uh, get what they need out of the vendors, um, helping uh, bridge that gap, really get that data and information that the customer, it's usually on the customer to, to get you guys some information. And the better that you guys do at Tier 4, the easier it is to do that vendor selection that you're talking about. So that's what I do, help them, help them get the data. Right, so a, you know, a client that maybe has never done a project in a particular area before, right. They have maybe, not confusion, but they have some things to learn about uh, what vendors are looking for from an answers perspective, uh, right. a scope, a project, um, an overall strategy uh, of the project. Obviously, you're helping our regional presidents around the country yep. you know, better communicate what the client is looking for, uh, what a successful project might look like and therefore helping expedite those types of projects because here again, you've done a lot of them. Yeah, and I've heard you talk a lot about like, you know, uh, th these projects are massive, some of them. And so eating that whole elephant, how do you do it? That's, that's tier four, right? That's right? How do we break this thing down? So that's really what I do, facilitate that for your Perfect. regional presidents, yeah. So the download podcast, again, we are coming to you live from the tier four HQ um, download studios. And uh, we are here to Nice talk about studio, by the way. It is. It is. I was it's impressed. a pretty good setup. Glad you can make it in first. Thanks. So, uh, Early morning makeup was killing me. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not used to it, it's a, it's a bit of a bear. It is. Yeah. Let's jump right into it. Best thing I saw all week. Brooks, we're going to go ahead and start with you. All right. I'm going to need Joel's help on this. We can cut the video. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe this. My wife showed me this. And this was funny because, you know, as you get older, you're like, you think you can do things? <laughs> you realize you can? So, so there's this video, I think it's on TikTok, where it, it shows, it's an older person showing the video of two young fit couple right and he does this like it's like a swing actually i think you've done this move before it's a swing dance move where you pull them from underneath and they you catch them and hug them and uh so they cut to the young couple and then the old couple was like okay let's ready to try this honey and they do it and it is just hilarious man <laughs> it's so good. Joel, we'll come to you. Best thing you've seen all week. Yeah, best thing I saw, Drew Brees, the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, he officially retired, came out and posted on Instagram with him and his four kids. Just uh, what a like upstanding, great guy. We wish him the best. Phenomenal career. I think like 19 total years in the NFL. I think 15 of those were with the Saints. Anyway, just guy who did it the right way. You want to see him succeed. Truly left an impact on the game, but you know, congratulations to him on his retirement. Hopefully he has lots of fun with his family. For what a, and, and what a cool way to do it, right? Yeah. All he saw was just his kid. He didn't see him. He's like, yeah, I said enough. It's so cool. Yeah. Great what guy. A, yeah. Stand up guy for sure. All right. All right. That's it for me. Jake, what's the best thing you saw all week? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> born and raised in California. I'm starting to see a lot of my friends children uh, starting to play sports again uh, online seeing you know friends children play high school football they're getting back to a little bit of normalcy back in California also you know again it might seem trivial to some but as a sports fan you're seeing uh, attendance at uh, 
yeah. at the recent golf tournament. You're seeing attendance now at spring training baseball games. Yeah, yeah, um, even the NBA is welcoming fans back into the arena. I think that, you know, again, it may seem trivial to some, but to me, I think that that is a, a great thing uh, yeah. for, for everybody, That's nationwide, awesome. worldwide. 100%. Yeah. Great. All righty. In the news, Joel, go ahead, kick it over to you on that one. You too. Google disrupting college degrees by offering certificates that are going to allow uh, those individuals with those certificates to get high paying jobs in a matter of two years versus a four year traditional college degree going the traditional route. Thoughts yeah. on that? For me, I think that's great. I do too. I, I think that training in your field of oh, what yeah. your desire is. Uh, certainly education I think is is necessary I think we as Americans are very blessed to have the educational sure. system that we do in comparison to other countries I think that goes without saying I do think that at times college is overrated uh, depending on what role you see yourself going into uh, as a as a professional um, not that it's bad but you know again are you better off learning you know getting a certificate in software development or you know, candidly learning on the job, uh, sure. or are you better going to, you know, let's just say a, a standard university if, in fact, you want to be a software developer? I don't know what the right answer is well, there. However, as a parent, uh, as a father, for my children, you know, again, I want to put them in a position to succeed. Um, and I mean, so as we talk about the way people are learning nowadays, you know, don't let the schooling get in the way of your education, right? And at the end of the day, again, our children are learning differently. We as adults are learning differently. You know, whatever that might be, if that's sitting down in a school environment, at a desk, in person, so be it. But it's different uh, now today than well, it was yesterday. I mean, man, this is a big topic. I guess I got kids, you got kids, oh, we all got kids. But yeah, schools changed because of, you know, the effects of COVID anyway. Like yeah. it instantly, we're doing things that we didn't think were possible. All right, guys, keeping it moving. Here we go. The first space hotel is set to open in six years, in 2027. You can take a weekend vacation to basically the equivalent of like an international space station that is a dedicated hotel. Are you, are you going or are you passing? No, I'll go for sure. It's an aggressive timeline, I, I gotta say. I mean, yeah, you're talking about <clears throat> well, well, death is surrounding you, right? So there's a lot of safety sure. concerns on that. But, but what's happened with SpaceX, Blue Wars, and all that in the last you know year is phenomenal. I mean, the what the uh, International Space Station took ten years to build, 30, 30 missions through the the, the challenge, the shuttle program, mm. yep. thirty missions to do that, and it took fifteen countries to put that together. Right, so you're getting to see an acceleration. So it's you know six years. It's just man, who knows? If it does, hats off to them. That's crazy. I just don't know how they're going to fund it. Right. I don't know that it's going to happen in six years. I think a lot of these things sure. are, you know, more to get attention. Sure. Uh, if we're being honest, but let's just even put it out there as a 2040 type of thing. Crazy. You know, if, if people are in space on vacation, even by 2040, I think it's pretty impressive. It's something that, you know, when you think about what vacations look like a hundred years ago, what are they going to look like in a hundred years? Uh, who knows, right? And I think space travel is only becoming more and more uh, readily available. Uh, not necessarily cheaper maybe, but I think that maybe there's a different way to monetize it or uh, it gives us an opportunity to maybe explore a little bit more as humans. So it's Think pretty cool. Think parent, like, don't feed the bears. I'm like, don't touch the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, yeah. You guys go. <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of uh, areas to explore here domestically, right? Let alone internationally. For and sure. then now you're talking about space. Yeah. But. All right. NFTs, non-fungible tokens. I'm going to rely on YouTube, brethren, a little bit better than myself, but an NFT, I mean, is this the future or is this just a bubble waiting to pop? So things are worth what people are willing to pay for them, right? And at the end of the day, it's crazy to think, I mean, you could, you know, what is Johnny Carson's microphone worth? Uh, what is a, you know, the original NFT of, you know, Gronk catching a, a Super Bowl touchdown worth? Uh, again, I, Six you know, million. I, I hate to judge, <laughs> but things are worth what people are willing to pay for. I guess the topic, though, is it, is it going to stick? Is it a trend? Is it a fad? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it a sustainable way of buying things, selling things? I, I'll say this. It's based off chain but blockchain right yep. chain block blockchain so there's some excitement there and it's for those of you watching crypto type stuff blockchain yeah. so it's uh, it's exciting that in that regard <laughs> and it is quote unquote unique but uh we'll get into one of these topics i hope about security i just you know i don't know man i 
Like this, you got some stuff behind this, right? Touch, you can touch, feel. Yeah. Tangible. So if I spent, you know, 67 million on a art, and I'll have to show you my iPhone. Like, look at that. Mm-hmm. Or what did I see? Did I? Did they in that one of those articles? Is Zion, Zion's block shot? They turn that into an NFT? Yeah, it's all. Hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, but I can watch the same thing on YouTube. I don't yeah. I don't I don't understand. I'm not an expert. I understand it. Maybe I'm too old. Yeah, it's too early for me. I wanna understand it better, but I don't know. I just it seems more complicated than it needs to be. I will say this. Our um, currency is going digital. I think art going digital is a natural thought. Again, things are worth what people are willing to pay for them. You know, are people overspending today because it's a fad potentially? Uh, but is it going to go away tomorrow? I don't think so. Facebook has dedicated about 10,000 employees to augmented and virtual reality. That's about a 20th of their entire workforce is dedicated to just developing and creating augmented and virtual reality experiences, platforms, and devices. Is augmented or virtual reality the future? Is it? Is it? Behind in the curve? Is it ahead of the curve? Where do you guys see that? Brooks, I'll let you start. Well, I was going to say, it de so these things are funny because what we know of it today seems absurd. Like, because I've done virtual reality, my kids are begging me. We just we got a new kind of setup and to, to set this virtual reality thing up in our room. I've delayed that. Sorry, kids. But um, the reality is what we think and what we know, I think augmented is a better word. Um, we're thinking of it too linearly, like a game that we're all going to be gaming. That's not it. I was on a, I was on a, I was on a plane ride with a gentleman who worked on, you know, Lockheed on the um, F-22, mm -hmm. and he said it was amazing. He did some stuff, but he got to put on the helmet. I think it was like 20 million or something like that. And he said what you could do, and this is augmented reality. He said you could look and see all through the plane, right? And that's because there's cameras, and then they augment with the heads-up display and the mask. So stuff like that, obviously, you know, the military is, is using it today. So as a pilot, there is no blind spot. I can see up, down, and everywhere, and, and I can see through the plane, through the cameras, right? So when you think of it like that, yeah, it's augmented reality is limitless. When, limitless. when you think about kind of virtual reality and all of this playing games or, you know, they've had some total recall and, like, you know, sexual stuff with virtual reality and all that. I mean, that's kind of limited. And like it's, it's a little confined. But when you think about augmented and how it can improve, I don't know, heads-up displays in cars, can it reduce traffic accidents and deaths? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's also part of it. So depending on what they're doing, it could be monumental how it could affect how we live, right? Yeah. The, the question is, is augmented reality uh, going to stick? Is it relevant? Is it, is sure. it something worth you know, uh, mentioning or, or paying attention to? I think the answer is yes. Um, augmented reality is not necessarily virtual reality. No. Augmented reality no. is something that is a layer of virtual reality on top of your actual, uh, you know, reality of life, right? Mm -hmm. So you're walking through the park and then your augmented reality is putting other things in there, you know, there's a bee over here or there's, you know, <laughs> whatever it might be. And, um, you know, adding to, it should be a, a layer of uh, complexity, so to speak, but a layer of also, you know, something on top of what you're already dealing and with. And natural, right? This year marks the 50th anniversary that email was officially introduced. And you think about how we use email today for work, for personal use. Uh, the average person receives 100 emails per day. And that's the average person. So that means some people are receiving 200, maybe 300 a day, and some people are receiving 50 or 40, right? The average person, this report also says that the average person checks their email every six minutes. Is that healthy? So, here, so here's what I did. I looked at email with my coworkers, and one of the coworkers I worked with closely, um, I had received and sent maybe 10 emails in three months because we had shifted everything to Slack. So internally, yeah. I wasn't doing anything. It was a little bothersome. Externally, however, like outside your office, email was still a large part. So I did this kind of little study and I was like, oh man, like internally I'm not, it's gone whew, way down for me in the last probably year for sure, two years, yeah. trending down and just dropped. But externally, it's still a big part of, of business. But I think of my 100%. kids too, though. Yeah. I mean, I, only think, I think the only reason why they need email is for like, what is it? Uh, Epic Games or Fortnite, something like that. They have to have an account. They're always like, what's this? And what's the password? But 
You, I don't know, man. We'll see how long it goes. But externally, yeah, it's it's a huge part of it. 50 years is crazy, man. Pretty yeah. wild. Coca-Cola is hiring for a director of IT procurement. I just applied. You applied? I'm, I'm thinking maybe I should apply too. And what I would do is I would say, use tier four. That's, that's literally what I would do. But, you know, large enterprises, small organizations, you know, like procurement is a, is a big part of their business, right? It's, it's, a, it's a proper protocol that needs to be in place, making sure that everything's accounted for and in track. But, I mean, there's just a better way to do it nowadays. You know, what we have seen is, is in IT procurement, especially if you are in, a, uh, in the middle of a large transformational charge uphill, um, you know, candidly, a lot of the in-house in procurement, in-house IT, uh, even in-house finance, in some cases, they just don't know what they don't know yeah. from a transformational project standpoint. Not that they're bad people, not that they're unneeded, but the reality is, is if in fact you're hiring for IT procurement, if it is a if it is because of a future transition to more transformational services, I would argue that maybe instead of hiring that W-2 employee to Joel's point, you might want to find a partner like Tier 4 Advisors who has been there, done that hundreds, if not thousands of times. I'll say this too there. There may be room for both. So when this person gets a job, right, right call Tier 4 because <clears throat> there's a difference of, I guess you think of that, you know, we talked about the email, internal, external, but an externally working with someone like tier four, huge help because they're going to have who knows how many projects they have going on. Yeah. And they're going to have to communicate inside to the internal, you know, army and lieutenants and C-suite, but, and that is a full-time job. Yep. Huge. So then you still need that outside. So I'd say, yeah, even, even with someone IT procurement, they're going to need the help, right? Yeah, it's it's sure. I mean, it's, it's getting more and more complex. I mean, we're going to talk, you know, hopefully hit on the email topic. I mean, that's huge, right? Huge. Unreal. How do I solve that? How do I find the right vendor? What do I do? Like, it's just nonstop, man. Right. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, cybersecurity experts predict that there will be a cyber attack every 11 seconds in 2021. So that means by the time I just described that sentence, there was one at the beginning <laughs> And then one at the end of the set. There's already been two cyber. There's already been two cyber attacks between that one sentence that I just said. Cybercrime damages are expected to be in the ballpark of six trillion dollars by the end of this year. Sad. What would this world be like if we didn't need to lock our doors, right? I mean, think about just us as a human race. Um, it's unreal to think that you know not only do we have doors that have locks on them, but you know from a security standpoint, technology-wise. Um, it's it's just sad to see. It's funny you said lock our doors. Like, it, I guess it depends on what you have in the door. Go with me on this one. So I have an old pickup truck, right? A Tacoma. I don't lock the doors in it because, to me, it's more valuable that someone doesn't break the window. doesn't break my window and open up. But it's, as you were talking, I was thinking, man, um, yeah, what if? We weren't so worried about that the places we locked up that day or that information were different. We're offline. There's going to have to be a shift. I mean, 11 seconds that I've known, you, we, can't keep, it's, we can't keep going like this. It's, Im, it's impossible, man. You're going to see, well, my, all, it's, going to, it's going to show itself in insurance going up. Cyberlight really is going to go nuts. It's going to, you're going to have uh, the adverse effect of overcorrection where people go completely offline, but then they're dealing with their own problems. Something does have to give. So if I, I think of it as compartmentalizing, if you take the things that are secure out, like this is not an attack on not using public cloud. Right? There's some great reasons to do all that stuff, but you've got to, there's got to be a balance, right? Of what's secure and what you're willing to put out there as opposed to what, what you're not. You know what I mean? Ha there's got to be some change. This is crazy. That statistic as, is nuts, man. As I think through it also, not to bring up you know, a totally different subject, but there was uh, someone that came out and talked about the, uh, the downside of wearing masks and the people that are wearing masks nowadays, every, being everybody, not understanding you know, how often to clean your mask or start over, how to put, them on, yeah, how to put yeah, yeah. them on properly, when to get a new one. You know, these types of things, you know, and, and referencing the fact that medical professionals have been quite literally trained on how to wear a mask. Whereas, you know, there's millions, maybe billions of people now wearing masks that have never been trained. And it's the same thing about technology when you think about it, right? Every single person, if they don't already, will eventually have a smartphone or something on their wrist that is tracking them. Something from a technology standpoint that, you know, who, who trains you on how to use this stuff safely? So... To your point, there's got to be a shift, and I think it really is that education and where you put data and where you don't put data and what 
you know, what's open to the public or on the internet, I don't mean just accessible. Some things just don't need to be. So Brooks, you have a long history of architecting and understanding data center projects, cloud, yeah. public hyperscale, or virtual public, virtual private, uh, even layered managed services. So I want to spend some time with you today since you're here at the Download Studios. The illustrious Download Studios. Uh, at Tier 4 HQ. Just talking about cloud, I think it's fair to say, you know, historically a lot of people will say, hey, pass me a Kleenex. And they refer to a Kleenex as a tissue paper thing that they're going to use to wipe their nose or something like that. Oh, the brand name Kleenex. The brand oh, name yeah, yeah, aspect yeah, yeah. of it, right? The duct tape concept. So a lot of people yeah, are like, oh yeah, we're going to AWS. Still today, 2021, talking about, yeah, we're going to AWS. Or they'll reference the fact that, nah, AWS is not the right fit. And then peeling the onion back a little bit, at least when I'm having an opportunity to talk to these IT leaders, I'm like, do you mean AWS as the landing spot or do you mean AWS as cloud? So just kind of starting as you know, the conversation, I want to know kind of your take on at what point does it make sense for, a, for an organization to uh, identify workloads to move into a cloud? And how would one decide if it's a Azure AWS Google deployment? Or if it makes sense, instead of replatforming or you know dealing with the proverbial swipe my card and see what my bill looks like next month for ingress, egress, all the other stuff, when does it make sense to then maybe go to a private cloud? So I'll, you, there's a couple questions up in that that uh, what you just brought up, but one of them is how they go about doing that and selecting. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is understanding what you have, right, and what you need. I know there's this concept that we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. That, that's great and it's wonderful. It's like an app rat. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you've got to you've got to find out. Frankly, that's kind of that's that's what I'm doing with Renovar is helping people find out. And that's what you get to help them find out what they what they have. Right. If you don't know what you have, where the bodies are buried, it's boring. Yeah. It's not sexy, but like you got to do it. So an right. app rat, by the way, is short for application rationalization. Yeah. It's yeah. a process that people go through understanding, again, what they have. Yeah. Yeah. Or assessments, right? Cloud assessments or technology assessments or just uh, maybe the CFOs come down and says, hey, why are we spending so much? And you just got to gotta rationalize or figure out what's going on. But that's the first part of it. The second is, I, I, I think just because AWS was the, you know, was the big elephant, um, if you've seen all this, the data about Microsoft Azure and like, they're just on fire, right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't surprising. But um, I mean, AWS kind of is kind of like that Kleenex, right? And I think most people don't know or they pick a side and they don't even realize, A, the price be the complexity. The reality is like, do you already have a staff that has, you know, does your staff have 20 AWS certified folks? Well, that probably makes more sense. Sure. Than going Azure or, you know, Google Cloud or Oracle or whatever else, right? Um, so that's one thing is they like, do, does your staff have that knowledge? Probably not. Like when they come talking to you guys or they're starting off exploring, they, they don't know that, right? Yeah. So they need that help. I'd say that that's the first thing is go, well, do you have those technical expertise? And they probably probably don't. Mm -hmm. If they did, they'd already have made up their mind, right? Um, but I think that's I think that's the first step is say, like, do you have the expertise? Do you know why you're going there? Do you I mean, are you a big fan of Jeff Bezos? Like whatever it is, you know, find out what it is that they, they need and what they're trying to do. It's also interesting to see some of the early adopters are now realizing they're competitors oh. of AWS. <laughs> Right, so they're Dude. pulling out of AWS. Maybe they're going more Azure, yeah. or they're realizing that maybe the public hyperscalers' tooling and resources aren't necessarily as much of a um, need as maybe they originally thought, and so they're going more of a private cloud. Talk yeah. a little bit about private cloud, where that makes sense, and why. Let me make one one quick mention first about like going from like for example AWS to Azure. One little un little not very well known fact about Microsoft is they basically said, you know what, we're not going to lose this game. We have the, they've been dealing with the edge their entire existence. And they said, hey, we have all these licenses and if you're already a Microsoft shop, you're gonna get all these credits. So that was what people don't really know. That's really what happened. Like this big shift, they're like, well, we'll just won't charge any license fees. And you go to AWS and they are. So that was one sure. big shift. But Got it. The, the big thing, on this, it goes back to security with private, private cloud, public cloud. I know there's naysayers out there who say, no, it's more secure than the public cloud. It is in some ways and isn't in others. But when you're talking about cost management, and we're talking about that control. If you have the team or the vendors um, set up to ha like a security team that has a patching platform and a schedule, just like the bigs, um, private cloud is, from a cost perspective, 
so much more uh, so much more accessible, so much more um, Economic effective, friendly. economical. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it really is. Not only that, I mean, um, the control that it affords and the ability to play in that space, the security. A, a great example is you guys remember Spectre Meltdown? This is dumb and boring, mm -hmm. but it came out and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you got to patch everything. Because what happens is if you're in a shared cloud and Joel's company and Jake's company, they're on the same infrastructure, Jake could actually sneak in on Joel's environment and take his data. Well, if you're in the private cloud space and we were in that space, you didn't have that problem, right? Jake had his dedicated, Joel has his. We just took a, you know, you take a normal approach and you patch it, but they're completely physically separate and, and isolated. So situations like that, you can kind of, kind of, I'm not going to say push away the fear, but you can put it on your regular schedule, your regular patch, and you take care of it. You don't have to drop everything, freak out, and, and, and lose your mind over it. I know this is going to be controversial. A lot of people say, that's nuts, that's crazy, but it's true. It, it was, it's a good example of how private cloud allows you to kind of bypass some of that narrative or delay it, maybe. I'm not trying to minimize security, but if, if think of it like a share, think of it like an office building, like in New York. I'm going to take down space and uh, Empire State next Building. Door. Sure. Yeah, right? Above you, I, below you. I don't know the Empire State Building's policy of what they're checking background on, you know. People going into I, the I, I hope they are. It's the Empire State Building. It's a major, you know, historic building. I assume that's true with AWS, but also with AWS, anybody with a credit card can get on that platform right. in the middle of the night. With a private cloud company, nobody. You don't even get quotes from them unless they know who's the buyer, what's the company name. You guys know this. What they're, looking for. what they're looking for. Yeah. And then once they get in, then they go, oh, okay, who, who are you? What are you? you know, they, they know all about your company before you buy infrastructure. Sure. You're not just getting a card and swiping. So you have that natural uh, control that doesn't you know, exclude you from dealing with security issues, like the exchange thing that just blew up. But it creates that they know who's coming and going, right? Yeah. Uh, it was interesting, last week I had a conversation with a, you know, let's call them Fortune 500 company for now. Um, and quite literally their production is on-prem, their DR is on-prem, on gear that they still own and operate themselves in their own office buildings, uh, including their telephony system is a legacy on-prem PBX. Uh, we were talking through, and again, the, the, the you know, thought process there is still transformation moving forward doing yeah. some new things. Right. Uh, my suggestion was you can always dip your toe, you can explore in categories. It's not just production. No, Where no. do you see a lot of people going? I mean, do you see people trying out the cloud, so to speak, with their their phones, their DR, uh, which was what my suggestion was. That's a great suggestion. Um, or just doing a, a full rip and replace and putting prod and DR in the cloud day one. I, I don't think, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that, with, especially the organization that's just now dipping their toes. Right, you right. know that. But right. no, rip and replace is a stressful thing for anyone. It's probably why they're talking to you because, like, oh my gosh, it's a huge project. Yeah. Um, I'd say, like you said, DR is a good one. Um, test dev environments. Um, I I'm a big fan of UCAS in that space a little more than say the economics apps. of UCAS it, by the way over the last three years have changed drastically it, right so three years ago the answer was no for a lot of enterprises yeah the answer today now is yes it makes sense let's put that on the roadmap for you know today tomorrow next year and it really depends right to the, what I was getting at is the, the application right mm -hmm. application rational, rationalization you hit on sure. early, right um, that's a good one because like the phone for us is that I just want it to work yep the Di feet, dial the, tone. Yeah, dial tone. It's a utility. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things that we're just as long as it's on, we're cool. It doesn't have to really do much. I mean, it does a lot. It has to always be on, uh, but you expect that, and so that's something that you can move, and it's out of sight, out of mind. It's not as, as big of a deal. And right? if it's done correctly, no one even knows it's done. If it's done right? correctly, that's, so that's yeah. part of what we always preach: yeah. is a lot of these projects, if they're done correctly. When people come in on Monday morning, they don't even know what took place over the weekend. Yeah. It was done correctly. You flip the switch, the lights came on. I don't know where the power's coming from, but it works. That's, let's talk about correctly too, right? Like you talk about a project like that, you flip the switch and everything works. Man, there are, if you talk about a timeline like this, there are months yeah. and months of preparation. Even when you select your vendor, 
it's, there's this gap point. of, of <laughs> making sure the project's moving, it's on time, that you've got the data, that you've hit the requirements that are that, that, that you have to right. from a from the customer's view. So that uh, yeah, man, and you know, folks like you guys, me, helping people make sure they hit those technical projects on time and within budget. Yeah, I mean that's. That's 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 the magic right there, right? That, that's part of another conversation that I had a few weeks ago. You know, and you're talking about cloud, you're talking about UCAS, you're talking about even contact center as a service, and people are like, "Oh yeah, that's probably not on the radar until next year." Well, guess what? Rather than me setting up a time to talk to you in September, we should start talking about that now. Oh God! Right? Because a lot of people think, "Oh, I'm not going to do that for another year or yeah. even another two years." You know, we'll talk about that then. If done correctly, to your point, a lot of these conversations are starting, you know, 6, 12, 18 months ahead of schedule, ahead of time to then start to understand again what the goals and rationalizations are if in fact that's where you need to go. And in that, so I've been in that space, a director of IT or CTO or whatever, but the, the understanding is like you're overworked, underpaid, underappreciated. I've been saying that for how long? A long Ever. time. But that's, it's true. And so that delay that I got that problem, I'll deal with that later. It, I mean, if you can start thinking, right, from a customer's perspective, like, hey, wait a minute. I can use someone to help me get things going in parallel because there's a whole lot of work that has to be done. I can't do it all. Let me leverage them. Let me leverage a, a company like Tier 4 to say, hey, can you start? I mean, you, are, you guys aren't offended by saying, hey, this isn't going to close for a year, but we know, we'd know we rather start now. You'd much rather do that, right? The engagement of the customer is better. The so. steps to do a project correctly oftentimes is where we leverage our expertise right. and our yeah. experience the most, yeah. right? It's not necessarily just introducing clients to vendors. It's understanding what step one through 100 is in a successful project. Yeah. And again, not to say that an, an internal IT professional or an internal uh, procurement or sourcing professional don't understand those steps. But it's just, in, in, in essence, you know, to give them almost a roadmap, if you will, how to progress down the path and make sure, again, it's done correctly the first time. And so I, you, you were talking about that UCAS and hitting that properly. I was thinking that about compliance, too, right? We think about compliance as this event that happens. It has to happen every year. Mm -hmm. But, man, I, the other 10 months out of the year, it's... You should be gathering and collecting, getting data ready for that, that singular event, that audit, right? right? And that's the same thing with any type of technical project. Yeah, there's a flip to switch, but man, all the prep. Uh, basically, IT folks can use help. Directors, chief technology officer, they need help. It doesn't help, hurt. And they just don't know. They don't know hurt. sometimes where to go. So it has to happen every year. Mm -hmm. But man, I, the other 10 months out of the year, it's... You should be gathering and collecting and getting data ready for that, that singular event, that audit, right? right? And that's the same thing with any type of technical project. Yeah, there's a flip to switch, but man, all the prep. Uh, basically, IT folks can use help. Directors, chief technology officer, they need help. It doesn't help, hurt. And they just don't know. They don't know hurt. sometimes where to go. So, yeah. Because you're doing a great job, Tier 4. Thank you. Thank you. You really are. We have a net promoter score of 97. That's a rating index from negative 100 to positive 100. Oftentimes, our vendor partners are very pleased with anything above a 50. Yeah. Um, and it, it goes to show what our services are like to have a 97. It goes a long ways. So a lot of people oftentimes will put off projects for a year or two because depreciation is something that they have yet to formalize. And what I mean by that is, is realize, I guess, fully. So it's, you know, yeah, we still got another two years left of depreciation, another, you know, whatever it might be. My saying has always been, don't let depreciation get in the way of innovation. Yeah, that's a good saying. We're sitting here talking about depreciation, and I understand that there's, there's numbers and dollars involved here. But w at what point do you, if you're having a conversation with a client and they're, they're saying, yeah,